Hi, how y'all doing? Uh, we are continuing our study of the Articles of Faith, and we have made our way down to Article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Uh, before we get started, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to study your word. We're asking, as always, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. Father, we thank you in advance, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, so we are on, as I said, article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Now, Arthur writes, We believe that such only are real believers, as endure unto the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture has been John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Our main focus uh, continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. So we've been looking at truth that will set us free if we let it. Uh, there are conditions. It won't just happen. That is why Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so one such truth is that we have the freedom from defeat, and that we have no obligation to the flesh. And we find that in Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 17 which is our second declaration that we've been studying. Um, and today, I'll read verses 5 through 6, and with an emphasis on the word mind. So, verse 5, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. And so we've been looking at defeat as a mindset. We said that if my mind tells me that I'm defeated, then I'm defeated. I can't be free if my mind is defeated. But if I change the message that I'm sending to my mind, then things will change. I ran across a few quotes uh, that brings out this thought. I'm not sure who said them, so I'm not giving anybody credit because I'm not sure who said it. But they're worth mentioning. Uh, the first quote is, The mind has a powerful way of attracting things that are in harmony with it, good or bad. In other words, if you think gloom and doom, then you will attract gloom and doom and vice versa if you think good thoughts then you attract good thoughts the next quote is happiness depends on your mindset and attitude and then there's one that says uh successful people don't have any fewer problems than unsuccessful people they just have a different mindset in dealing with them so if you change the way you look at things the things you look at will change. Once your mindset changes, everything on the outside will change with it. Uh, here's one for you sports fans. It says, turning pro is a mindset. If we are struggling with fear and self-sabotage and procrastination, self-doubt and things in that sort, then the problem is we're thinking like amateurs. Amateurs don't show up. Amateurs crap out. Amateurs let adversity defeat them. The pro thinks differently. He shows up. He does his work. He keeps on trucking no matter what. Then there's a quote by Maya Angelou which says, 
If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. And finally, in the fixed mindset, those that just can't change anything, everything is about the outcome. If you fail or if you're not at your best, in the fixed mindset, it thinks that everything was wasted. Everything you did, nothing counts. With the fixed mindset, you believe that you are who you are and you cannot change. In other words, my mama like this, my daddy was like this, so I'm going to be like this. But that mindset creates the problem when you're challenged because anything that appears to be more than you can handle is bound to make you feel hopeless and overwhelmed. The opposite of the fixed mindset is the growth mindset. It allows people to value what they are doing, what they're doing, regardless of the outcome. They're out there tackling problems and charting new courses and working on important issues. People with a growth mindset uh, believe that they can improve with effort, that they outperform those with a fixed mindset, even when they have a lower IQ, because they embrace challenges treating them as opportunities to learn something new. And if I was going to just sum all this up, it would be in Proverbs 23 and 7, which says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Uh, I exercise with, and I call her my, the lady on the exercise tape, but when, when the lady on the exercise tape, when a, a particular exercise is tough, she'll say, come on, you can make it. Tell yourself that. And, and I've noticed that when I have an attitude, when I have an I can attitude and tell myself that I can do this, I can hang in there. Uh, but, but if I'm in one of those moods and I'm whining to myself and I'm telling myself how hard it is and and I don't want to do it and, and all that, I find that it's hard to do it. And, and, and so it's hard to keep on. So it's all about your mindset. And so we've been looking in our quest of, of, of looking at the truth and how the truth will set us free. We've been looking at the disciples, uh, Peter in particular, and we, we've looked at how his mindset went from, in essence, being on top of the world when he was with Jesus to that of being defeated after Jesus was crucified. And, and while Jesus, while Peter was walking with Jesus, he was, on, he was like a rock star. He was like a celebrity. And, and, but then after the crucifixion, uh, Peter spent two days in, in, in shock and, and despair and afraid and cast down with shame and guilt and regret. Can you imagine Peter living with the shame of denying Jesus after boldly and loudly declaring that he would rather die with Jesus before he would deny him? In my mind, Peter has spent the last two nights with little or no sleep wrestling with the wouldas, the shouldas, the couldas, uh, wrestling with the ifs and the if onlys and what could have been. And can you imagine in his mind, can you imagine his feelings of hopelessness? That feeling of what have I done? That feeling of what do I do now? He had spent three years totally depending on Jesus. Now what? Jesus, being guided by the Father, had decided for those three years, he had decided where they would go, what they would do, when they got there, and, and how long they would stay. They had experienced bountiful blessings because they hung around Jesus. They had been safe because they hung around Jesus. They had been with Jesus for so long and he had made such an impact on them. And, 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 and can you see that Friday? They were like, now what? what? What do I do? I would imagine 
that they literally did not know what to do. Re remember in the sixth chapter uh, when, when Jesus started talking about eating his flesh and, and drinking his blood and, and a lot of his disciples, not the 12, said that that was too much for them to take. And, and the Bible says that many turned from walking with him. Then in verse 67, Jesus says to the 12, will ye also go away? And, and then our boy Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou has the words of eternal life. And, and, and then he says, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. Can you imagine Believing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and now he's dead. How, how do you, in your mind, how do you work that out? And, and to add insult to injury, they all turned their backs on him at a time when, humanly speaking, he needed the most. But Peter took it a step farther. He not only turned his back, but he also denied him. What do you do with your faith when you believe that the son of the living God is dead? You saw him be killed. You went to the funeral and you went to the graveyard. What do you do with that? Dead means dead. It is separation. It's farewell. It's final. Their death is not just final. Death is so final. Means it's gone. It's over. Whatever you didn't say or didn't do when death comes, it's too late. You, you can't go back. Not, not even for one more minute. Not even for one more second. Death is final. Remember David when the child that he fathered with Bathsheba was sick. And 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verse 16 and 17 says, David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. Then, after seven days, the Bible says the child died. The servants were too afraid to tell him because David was in such a state. The, the king had prostrated himself on the ground, begging God, had not eaten anything and, and, and not washing himself for seven days and seven nights. And, and so David heard them whispering like over in the corner. And, and David asked them if the child was dead. Probably, and, and the, they were probably fearing their lives. They got, yeah, he's dead, David. And the Bible says that David got up, cleaned himself up, and worshiped God. Then told his servants to bring him some food. Now, here's the point that I was trying to get to. Verse 21, it says, his servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. Verse 22, he answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And, and so that's the reality of death. That's how Peter and the disciples felt. Now, the real reality is that they could have spent those two days in anticipation, in expectancy, in eagerness. Uh, they could have had two days of hopefulness, so excited that it would have been hard to contain them because Jesus had told them, I'm going to get up. I I I'll be gone for two days, three days, but... I'll rise again. But they experience the opposite. 
You ever been so worried or afraid or defeated or in such despair that your days are spent despondent and your nights are long and, and full of tears and no matter what you do, you can't sleep. Sleep just won't come. Uh, you, you ever had a season of nights like Beg and Lenny? Most of us know Beg and Lenny in the song, Cause I Love You. Lenny said, he, he said he watched television until television went off. And then he played his records until he didn't want to hear them anymore. And finally he went to bed but found himself waking up a few hours later. He, he said that it got so bad till one time he thought he rolled himself up in a big old ball and died. And then Lenny said that he met somebody that made all the difference. For Lenny, he met his sweetheart. But for Peter, Sunday morning came. David said in Psalms 32, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy coming in the morning. That Saturday night, Peter didn't know it, but joy was coming in the morning. Joy was about to come because early on Sunday morning, the grave could no longer hold Jesus. Death could no longer keep him in. And as the song says, he got up. God raised him up. The grave is left empty and death is left powerless. Very early on Sunday morning, the discovery is made. John 20, the 20th chapter, verse 1 and 2 says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark until the sepulchre, and see the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she run it and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and, the, uh, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and, and, and went in into the sepulcher, and see the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went into also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again after death. Then the disciples went away again unto their own homes. And I should point out here that at this point, they didn't believe that Jesus was alive. They believed that somebody had taken the body someplace. Verse 10 says, then the disciples went away again to their homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And, and that is where she got to be the first to see the risen Lord. And at this point, by reading the Sunday morning account by each of the gospel writers, we find that there is a whole lot of running and a whole lot of hurried walking going on. Folk are running back and forth and, and, and telling this and that. In, in Matthew, the women come to anoint the body and are told by the angels to go and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and they are to meet him in Galilee. But Mark gives us a little bit more detail. Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 6 through 13 says, But he, being the angel, said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, 
for they were afraid. Then an amazing thing happened when, when they get to where the disciples are hiding. An amazing thing happened, but you got to come back next time to find out what it is.